Hello and welcome to a new episode here on the Wars Rebellion podcast for Age Civil War. I'm your host again, Niels Eichhorn. And today I'm going to the sunny state of Arizona with you guys. And we're going to do something uniquely new for the channel. We've done a lot of Civil War stuff already over the last couple of months. Um, if you have followed the written interviews for a couple of years now, but for the first time, we're going to start branching out, which the channel will be doing more to Latin America. And joining me today is an old acquaintance of mine, Marco Cabrera Gezerik. He is an assistant professor of comparative cultural studies at Northern Arizona University which we will establish is the nice part of Arizona and not the hot <laughs> part like Tucson and Phoenix. But he has been to Phoenix uh, quite a bit, actually, because he got his um, all of his degrees. I just look here, BA in psychology and then MA and PhD in history at Arizona State University. But we are going to talk today about a book that I found extremely fascinating reading. Um, probably one of my top 10 books done so far on like the channel in various forms. The book is <clears throat> published with Roman and Littlefield, The Legacy of the Filibuster War, National Identity and Collective Memory in Central America. So Marco, first of all, thank you so much for taking some time this morning to join me and let's dive into how did you come well I, I guess i should say the first time i met you you delivered a paper about um i think it was cartagena in colombia and sort of micro nations or post na na post independent nations that never made it in in central south america and mm -hmm. um now we got a book on memory. So how did that come about? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Niels, for, for having me. And uh, thank you very much for the kind words in relation to, to my book. Um, of course, as always, these books are um, a work of love. And uh, to to receive any kind of a praise is always, you know, uh, it's a little bit deserved your ego in some way, you know. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, how do you get into this topic? Well, um, there's kind of a, a very long answer, so I'm going to try to keep it short. The, the issue of memory, actually, is a, it's a personal issue because, um, well, actually, uh, the, the Colombian uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, actually once said that that all writing is biographical. Mm. And uh, in my case, actually, I was not born in Costa Rica, not born in Latin America. Um, on my mother's side, um, I'm German. I was born there, and uh, but I moved to Costa Rica when I was very little with a father that was not Costa Rican either, Guatemalan actually in his case. So um, the interesting thing, of course, growing up in Costa Rica was that in in some way of, as a child I adapted very fast and very easily, mm -hmm. but at the same time none of my parents were from there. So that always gave me that kind of insider outsider uh, kind of thing, right? Yeah. And to start to encounter. This Costa Rican society, for example, uh, the, the celebrations of Holy Week, that really mm -hmm. impacted me because, of course, uh, this was not something common when, when I was uh, growing up in Germany. Mm -hmm. And then not only that, very soon also the, the, the civic celebrations, like the mm -hmm. civic celebration of the national holidays, independence and uh, some other aspects, especially the filibuster war in Costa Rica is very important. Um, and starting to learn this, but at the same time, again, being an outsider allowed me to actually be critical mm -hmm. while at the same time being very close to the topic. So um, this is what brought me into the issue of memory, because, of course, one thing is history, which is the events. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that is very important is how do we decide to remember them? Because I, I, I could see some, some kind of contradiction, some kind of lack of consistency in some of the narratives uh, mm -hmm. that I heard about all these events. And I was only. And why do you believe this? Why do you think this is the right way to 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 approach it? Why do you think that's the only truth and cannot be touched, right? Yeah. yeah. So of course it has to do with the with the social frameworks. Here I'm talking about one of the 
uh, most important um, uh, theories that I use for, for my book, uh, uh, Maurice Halbach's, when he talks about the show, social frameworks that actually help to develop mm -hmm. collective memory. So um, that's actually my interest in, in memory. Uh, I always was fascinated by the filibuster war and that kind of took me to the uh, mid of the 1800s, but also to the idea of the construction of the nation, uh, mm -hmm. of course, national identity. Yeah. Uh, why do we realize or why did we decide that that uh, that a piece of cloth with some specific colors uh, mm. are worth dying or fighting for, right? right? So these kind of things are connected to national identity. And the question, of course, okay, when were this, the, these nations created in Latin America? And of course, I learned that a lot of them didn't make it. Yeah. So uh, that that was actually the, the topic that I was exploring when 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 we met. But of course, that is is, is really connected to this work of the filibuster uh, war in, in theoretical terms, of course. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's uh, that's fascinating, and I think that's sort of a the insider outsider perspective is always an interesting one to have. Sort of right. I mean, I return to my home region and. Like, yes, I grew up in this region, but it's not quite home anymore because I've spent half my life in, outside of it. So it's, it is kind of an interesting opportunity to kind of see that and kind of look at what people in uh, who live there all the time, kind of for them, it's daily, daily life. It's normal. And you kind of are like asking questions that they kind of never thought about probably in, mm -hmm. in that, um, so did your school, like kind of getting ahead of me a little bit with the questions, did your school participate in any of the filibuster um, <laughs> events? In... We had to. We had to. That's oh. uh, actually the day that that, that, that um, they celebrate now the filibuster war, April 11, was a holiday, but relative holiday. I mean, there were no classes, but you had to attend uh, very early in the morning and, and there were a series of anthems you had to memorize days before and sing them. Uh, patriotic anthems, of course, yeah. and it was a big honor to actually be part of the parade. Um, oh. I'm actually uh, I used to live in in Alajuela, which is actually the the second largest city in the country, very close to the capital city, actually, oh. and that's where actually the national hero is from. Yeah, so I was just going to say that is that's Santa Maria. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Juan Santa Maria actually. The house where he was born and he lived, uh, um, of course, the house is not standing anymore, but it was located just a block away from my school. Oh, my gosh. So now it's a monument, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so you can see that connection. Of course, I yeah. was like, what is going on here? And for most of my classmates, it was very normal. But I was oh, yeah. uh, pointing out a lot of things. What is happening here? And why is this so important? And who is this guy, etc.? So it was very important and honor to actually participate in the parade. So actually, yeah. all the elementary schools participated in the parades, especially the ones in Alajuela. And the, the idea was to actually march all the way to the statue of Santa Maria. And then from there, to march all the schools back to where the house of uh, Juan Santa Maria used to be, right? So uh, I, I tried several years until finally, right. my last two years of elementary school, I was able to participate in a parade. Wow. And then in high school, I continued that tradition, uh, uh, marching, you know, with the band and things like that. Wow, I think that this raised so many questions in my mind of like, uh, hey, why aren't there any pictures of you in the in the book? No, <laughs> you don't want those pictures. <laughs> it must like you got to have pictures, right? You, your parents must have pictures of you participating in those. It's, and then you write the book about it. That's that's like it's almost like you said history is personal but in your case it's it's really personal right like i mean i can like with my first book liberty and slavery i can claim yeah there's sort of a personal connection because some of the characters grew up in my home region but mm -hmm. yours is way more personal than that because you you grew up you got educated in the sh in the shadow of juan santa maria there you go, indeed, and that that was very familiar for me to see the statue all the time, to even play in the in the square where the statue is, which is yeah. basically in downtown and things like that. But of course, I think that that again, the insider outsider thing was was that one that helped me get interested on on why mm. and, and and where did this come from and who is this really this guy and 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 why do we celebrate him and not somebody else, for example? Yeah. Wow. Oh man. <laughs> No, I'm really happy I brought you on for today. This is going to be so much fun. Um, so we we briefly talked, and and this sort of 
challenging question that I had that a lot of people have. It's sort of like, what what do you consider yourself, right? Uh, I mean, are you a Costa Rican historian? Are you a Latin Americanist? Do you consider yourself a 19th, 20th century memory, like political? What, like, like, like when you went out for jobs, like what would, like what what were you applying for? Right, right. No, definitely, I'm a Latin American historian. That's my my main hat, right? Yeah. Um, actually, my my master's thesis was uh, more like a 20th century thing. It had to do with okay. the fall of uh, mm -hmm. Arbenz in 1954 in Guatemala. Oh, yeah. But uh, for the dissertation, I said to change the topic, and then mm -hmm. that's when. As always, you know, taking different classes with different professors yeah. start to to inspire certain things. Mm -hmm. I, I I was lucky enough, uh, one of my uh, mentors actually uh, specialized on on collective memory, uh, mm -hmm. national identity. So I took mm -hmm. uh, two or three classes with her, uh, Victoria Thompson, and uh, that actually allowed me to to for the first time I felt that it was not just reading history, but it was about mm -hmm. understanding history through the lens of a theory. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to to play, so be, become a real historian, right? To yeah. apply a theory over these these events. Yeah. So and um, and I don't know, maybe that that dynamism of this topic actually is the one that got get me into this. But and of course, I start to think about what kind of topics can I talk about that mm -hmm. uh, uh, analyze national identity and memory studies. And I said, yeah. well, let's go for the easy route, you know. <laughs> And it was not easy at the end. Actually, it was way, way more complex. It was supposed to start as a as a little article, just explaining, mm. you know, how uh, this national holiday came into being <laughs> and how it was celebrated. And then I realized, wow, I didn't understand that that there was all these mm. complex local, regional, political uh, uh, forces, and then how much change uh, uh, in this little country, uh, um, you know, happened. That I I don't see it in in other countries. With, where the story of the creation of national identity mm -hmm. and, and national monuments and national heroes is more straightforward, right? Yeah, and it, it, it's something that eventually I did in my my survey courses in in the states was U.S. history that I kind of was like, let's explore the history of the United States through this lens of remembering and in in places in kind of different ways because it's it always felt more meaningful for the students to like think in terms of like what. How do we connect to this? How how do we purposefully remember something versus like, oh, here's a textbook, re remember these names, dates, and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, but kind of related to that, when it comes to memory, well, actually, let me let me open the door for you to explain it to the listeners because like I, I, they they have done, I'm sure many of them know kind of Civil War memory studies and. But it never really dives into the methodology and sort of the series that you do, which is sort of was really fascinating because you kind of take the nationalism, the works on nationalism and kind of look at them through the, this lens of memory studies like Hobsbawm and Imagine Communities with Benedict Anderson and so on. And it was really fascinating how you kind of crafted that methodology and returned to it throughout the book over and over and kind of used them to kind of explain like this is a frame this is a theory and here's how costa rica actually does exactly that indeed indeed um maybe i should uh, go a little bit into the different names and, and theoretical approaches i use and, and and how they work a little bit in the book uh, i mentioned already maurice uh, halvax um, mm -hmm. uh, his work on collective memory is, is fascinating and it's a very old work, but I think that he is able to synthesize something very important, which is the concept of individual memory taking okay. up to the collective and how this is created. I always uh, like to use some kind of analogy, like um, to, to explain how collective memory is created. And uh, imagine yourself, for example, living in, in a building, you know, in a four story or something like that. And suddenly you hear a very strong screech, like a car breaking and then boom. A crash. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the balcony, let's say, and you see actually the two cars, you know, in the accident. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Perfect. And then you mm -hmm. go downstairs and actually you start to ask uh, people, okay, well, what happened, you know, and and uh, you see one of the cars in the middle of the road and the other one uh, crashing into it. And you immediately assume the logic, right? Okay, this guy mm -hmm. was crossing when he wasn't supposed to and that happened. And then you hear somebody telling you, actually, no, this guy uh, stopped there because he was something like out of gas and this guy just didn't stop so it was mm -hmm. actually that the, the oh, yeah. fault of the guy that crashed yeah. into that the other one 
the interesting thing is that this is something you heard. Mm -hmm. Somebody told you this. Yeah. And in two days, when you are in a bar with a friend, and then suddenly the conversation goes back, oh, did you hear about the accident? Oh, yes. You're going to repeat that story. Mm -hmm. You didn't see it. Yeah. You were not a witness. And mm -hmm. still, you're going to accept it. And then you're going to repeat that story to others. And that's going to become the official story of what happened. And yeah. still, you have no proof, no evidence of that. Yeah. That's how collective memory is created. It's only we all agree on something, mm -hmm. even when we don't really have an evidence or because we need to create a narrative to solve questions, right? And yeah. that's part of what, what this book is about, stories. We are made of stories. We are made of narratives. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what is happening here is, is okay, why did, did the Costa Ricans decide to take this story yeah. and change it so many times mm -hmm. depending on their needs, right? Yeah. So, of course, I was I was thinking a little bit about when the filibuster war happened. This is just the, the last antebellum hurrah for the pro-slavery states mm -hmm. in the United States, right? So this the war happened between 1855 and 1860. Mm -hmm. In fact, I always... I've been trying to, to think about the, the, the execution of William Walker in the beginning mm -hmm. of a civil war, if there is not so such a connection there. And maybe, actually, uh, mm -hmm. if there's not a big connection between the fall of, of the filibuster project in Central America and the beginning of the lost cause myth in the United States, mm -hmm. I think there's a strong connection there. But another no. important thing is, is uh, Benedict Anderson. You mentioned him as, as mm -hmm. well, the idea of the imagined communities. And of course, the idea for these Costa Ricans that used to be part of Spain, that used mm -hmm. to be part of the Central American Federation, and now what are we? And what are the bases, the values, the, the symbols that are going to help us to create this exactly. new identity, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sorry, I think I, I interrupted you. No, I, I was also just like, uh, I mean, he also have Eric Hofsbaum, of course. I mean, this a big nationalism scholar. He, he kind of belongs in there. And so it, it's a really fascinating, but I... Um, as you were talking, one of the things that came to mind was also the sort of notion, right, that um, the community creates this memory and forms it and then reformulates it and it, it alters over time a few times. And it's it, it's something that I think historians sometimes struggle with that don't do memory studies or don't kind of, kind of look into it more seriously that what you have here is a historically based um, story, but it's what the communities make out of them, right? Actually, that's an important thing because, again, when we think, think about history, we think about the specific events and how people actually mm -hmm. got involved into that. Yeah. But the interesting thing is that from the point of view of the present, what we care about is the values that we associate yeah. with those events. Not only how they transform society, which of course they did, mm -hmm. but how they continue to transform society. That can only happen if that society decides to accept the values or reject the values that may happen too, mm -hmm. that uh, were promoted by that event. Yeah, yeah. So it's not only about economics, and and uh, this is of course very Lacanian, you know, a psychoanalytic mm -hmm. uh, approach that uh, argues that we are made of of stories, that we are made of of narratives. Humans mm -hmm. are. That we are that that the structure of the brain is actually made by words, so uh, therefore we cannot understand even the events that happen without having some way to interpret them. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's the value of memory studies is is extremely important, um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we historians do: we interpret the events. Yeah. So memory studies is a different tool to interpret uh, these yeah. events. Well, yeah, and it kind of has is the fun of the changes over time that we can look at as a result of it. Uh, but you also already kind of indicated the the challenge with it a little bit because memory studies is, and I I kind of thinking here like I'm 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 an IB teacher today, international baccalaureate teacher, and in the global politics there's always this leveling of like you might start on the local and then you go to the regional, to the national, mm -hmm. to the international, and to the global, and it's it exactly feels like that with yours too, where it's sort of like there is sort of the the local narrative for the different towns, communities in Costa Rica, and then you go to the regional, you go to the to the national state level, and it's sort of these, um, it's almost like an onion, right? You kind of have these different layers that you're dealing with in in all of it. 
Indeed, that's something actually I, I was um, thinking about when I was writing this book and, and getting so much into these different uh, um, theories of national mm -hmm. identity. Yeah. And I realized that actually there were several identities playing at the same time. And then, of course, I remember, mm -hmm. again, Halbach's talking about the different social frameworks. We yeah. are not made of one single identity. We're made mm -hmm. of several different identities. Yeah. Uh, the church is one of... Uh, 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 produces a certain kind of a communal identity. Mm -hmm. uh, your your soccer team is another commun community that you belong to, and and so on, right? So I, start, I started to think about it, and definitely, national identity is 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 part of the myth that we build on ourselves and our communities. Mm -hmm. But we all have communal identities. We all have regional identities, mm -hmm. and even larger identities. As a Latin American, for example, we we have these uh, terms of the patria chica and the patria grande. Uh, the Ooh. small fatherland and the large fatherland. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so Costa Rica is my, my patria chica. Definitely there is an identity. Mm -hmm. But I feel this strong connection with most of Latin America, even when those countries mm -hmm. are so different from each other. And this is the patria grande. Mm -hmm. And I can feel it when, when I, I meet different uh, people from Latin America and different parts of the world. We recognize that even when they are so different, that there is a kind of a sense of community there. Uh -huh. It's an easy easy way to connect to each other. Oh, yeah, At the same that's... time, and I, I explore this in my book, there is the importance of the local. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in yeah. fact, uh, you read it, of course, the interesting thing is, is that a local identity, a local story becomes a national story. Yeah, yeah and uh, we definitely want to explore that today a lot more. Um, just as a note for both of us, um, stay away from Latin American food in Europe. <laughs> okay we had terrible luck was that in austria it was bad <laughs> what's they classified yeah. as mexico I, I wouldn't do that sorry <laughs> yeah no. Maybe... no i'm that kind of person that if i go to one place i, I want to try what the local thing you know so yeah schnitzel wasn't much better either unfortunately in austria <laughs> i can um, see that <laughs> I'm, I'm glad the germans agree with me on the the sauce <laughs> thing that the austrians did not like about me <laughs> <laughs> um but let's see here so i'm gonna assume that if my listeners don't know what the filibusters are they can look it up there's great books yours included but then robert may has done some great work on that too mm -hmm. so they can Indeed. They can look up who William Walker and the filibusters and all those guys are. So let's get into the meat of things with regard to to your stuff. And I'm going to start with the curveball because you, you have William Walker, you have Costa Rica in there. We're going to start with the William Walker movie <laughs> because I, okay. want to, I want to hear your opinion on that thing. I remember seeing it actually in the theaters. Oh my God! Out. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. you spend money for that thing? <laughs> well, thought... in Costa Rica, they had to show it, of course, right? How was? Oh, you watched it in Costa Rica, right? How was the reaction to that there, then? Even more so, because well, to be honest, the movie is very Hollywood esque, mm -hmm. and uh, and, totally. and and therefore it creates a lot of problems. But on the other hand, it kind of follows the main narrative of the story of Walker, except for that last. For the end, a few minutes. Uh, well, there's a, a lot of anachronisms. That, that the end is yeah. the most surprising, of course. Uh, but but there are a lot of different things going on already yeah. that are really problematic. Uh, the film is interesting in the sense that it really uh, approaches, you know, the arrival of Walker to Nicaragua, why he arrived, mm -hmm. and um, even his his uh, battles and Rivas and Granada. Although, of course. There are a lot of lies as well. He lost in the, mm -hmm. uh, the Battle of Rivas in the movie. Actually, he's shown that he's, uh, as he won the battle. Yeah. Another big problem, uh, of course, he was uh, from Tennessee. He was uh, in, 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 from the 1950s. He was a pro-slavery guy. Mm -hmm. To have uh, African-Americans in his uh, army, never happened. No way. That would have never happened. <laughs> uh, he was I very think clear there was like it. Hungarians and some Germans in that army, but yeah, there were. <laughs> So 48ers, actually, for example, yep. um, like Henningsen, he was uh, very famous. He fought in, uh, in the revolutions of 48 in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Later, he actually joined the Carlist Wars in Spain as well. Oh, you know? wow. wow. And, These and, guys yeah. are just fascinating. Uh, a lot of them, yeah. Very inter interesting. So um, the movie, yes. 
that of course you have to understand the period. This is the late eight, 1980s, so that the Contras war in Nicaragua was going on, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that that the, the director, what he was trying to do was to actually point out, okay, this is the first time that the United States is involved in Nicaragua. This has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And of course, he uses the story of Walker, which this happens every five years or eight years, somebody in the United States suddenly rediscovers Walker mm -hmm. and finds out how crazy this, this uh, invasion of Central America was. And of course, they get fascinated. Really, we did that? Okay. And then have to write an article in a newspaper or a movie right. or a novel or something. So he comes back all the time. It's, it's a fantastic story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we're not going to spoil the movie for those who haven't watched it and want to <laughs> know, not watch it with what actually happens there at the end. But yeah, it is fascinating how this, he just comes back every couple of years. I was like, oh, Look who I discovered and how amazing <laughs> what crazy story can bring. <clears throat> but let's talk, having that out of the way, let's talk about the name for a moment because you, uh, as I mentioned before we started, there's some Spanish terminologies that I'm not capable of doing, but one of them is you, you kind of say that in um, Central America, it's oftentimes called La Guerra contra los filibasteros. And you disagree with that Latin American uh, or Central American terminology, and you created sort of your own terms for this. Indeed, indeed. I, I find the names uh, very problematic, and um, there are actually several uh, names for this event, which is common from uh, many other uh, wars. You know, they have two or three names, depending. Um, but I think it's very important to understand what are we talking about. So actually, the, the first time that this war had a name uh, was actually Nicaragua. They actually uh, called this war La Guerra Nacional, the National War. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that actually when Walker arrives to Central America, to Nicaragua, he's actually invited by one of the two factions that were uh, um, confronting each other in a civil war in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. So he allies with one of the factions and what happens is that um, at the end of this conflict, the two fighting factions join and realize, okay, no, we have to expel Walker from here. Mm -hmm. And then they join and create this kind of a sense of national unity. Mm -hmm. And that's why they call it the Guerra Nacional, because it's a war mm -hmm. that finally allows Nicaraguans to create a national uh, government that is yeah. com compromised or comprised actually of the different factions. So the, the, the word actually makes sense, but mm -hmm. for Nicaraguans. For yeah. Costa Ricans, it doesn't make sense to call it a guerra nacional because it was a very different process. Mm. So the Costa Ricans start to adopt that name as well, but mm. then they started to call it differently. They call it the uh, Campaña Nacional, the National Campaign, mm. because it was a long process. Yeah. But uh, but so they changed it a little bit. This they changed the name again. I have heard it also called the Guerra del 56, the mm -hmm. War of 56. Also problematic because they're reducing the whole war that lasted from 1855 to 1860 to two events that happened in 1856. Yeah. We can talk about those events because they are now national holidays. But uh, it's, it's fascinating how they reduce everything. Mm. And by the way, this is actually something I learned when I was in, in, in elementary school. Basically, everything that they talk about is the two battles that happened in 1856 and not the whole war. So it's also even in that the official discourse kind of selects what to remember and what not, right? Yeah. So I see that Guerrero 56, the World 56 doesn't work. Mm. The most official one actually uh, used as a title for a book uh, by one of the most prominent Costa Rican historians mm. of the um, uh, 20th century. He called it La Guerra Contra los Filibusteros, the war against the filibusters. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking it makes sense because that's how you can see it from the Costa Rican point of view. Mm -hmm. This is a war that we are waging in order to expel the filibusters. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, who is the, the main actor here? Who is the one that is starting the war? Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I challenge that and I call it the filibuster war, which actually has gained some acceptance. I have seen that uh, that term starting to be used in, in different uh, venues. Um, oh, nice. That doesn't mean that it's the dominant. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. as always, competing discourses, right? But I, I think that this should be called a filibuster war because it's the filibusters that brought the war. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that, that define the war. Right. It's not Costa Rica, it's not Nicaragua, right. it's not Central America that the, the ones that start 
uh, the mm -hmm. war, I mean, you can talk about the, the two factions in Nicaragua fighting, but that would be a civil war totally yeah. separate from the filibuster right. war. So I think that that's why I use that term, because I think that it's important to to figure out who is the one, uh, mm -hmm. the aggressor here, and, right. and who has that, that clear goal of what they want to do, and that's mm -hmm. the filibusters, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, right? And it's, 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 you can look at it and I think that's oftentimes a problem in the, uh, from the U.S. perspective. It's this this presentation of like like I, again I'm thinking sort of Robert Mace's work, and it's it's very much sort of like here's the story of the filibusters, Walker, and all these people in the U.S. and Washington and Costa Ricans and Nicaraguans are sort of the uh, a side story to it all because it's, it's like I mean we can speculate. I I personally think it's oftentimes language barrier and a bit of laziness at not going to Latin America and kind of doing the research for these types of projects. Mm. But it's, it, it, it's, it's nice. That's why I really enjoyed your book because you actually had the, the other perspective. You had the perspective of the locals that are fending off the co the, the filibusters. Um, so. Indeed. Uh, I mean, all, all my respect for Robert May, I have read his books and uh, they're fantastic. Um, I think that in, in his case, I will I will uh, uh, forgive uh, forgive him for doing that because I think his approach he makes it very clear. I want to study yeah. the filibuster movement and, yeah. and the yeah. southern slavery movement and all that yeah. stuff. Um, but but this is a critique I have uh, against uh, most uh, historians of the United States that actually uh, talk about uh, the war. And you can see it even in recent titles, you know, mm -hmm. uh, William Walker and such and such, and uh, the filibusters in Central America. And it it's clear that. They want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that there's a whole trend of uh, romanticization of the filibusters as well, mm -hmm. which yes. tells me a lot of, of about the writers, right? Why are they, they presenting this in a kind of a romantic way? Yeah. And um, that's what I wanted to bring. And uh, a little bit mm -hmm. from the perspective of, of Latin America, but also mm -hmm. from the, the most common uh, and accessible works, uh, newspapers, uh, uh, history mm -hmm. books, so most like more more like interpretation of all these events, right? Yeah. Speaking of newspapers, um, that was fascinating. Where you kind of looked at, and there were there were hardly any newspapers in Costa Rica, right? Like, like that at that time, almost none. Yeah. Um, well, we I, have to I remember. I did not expect that. <laughs> well, we have to remember that Costa Rica actually it's it's a it's a country that actually became a republic in eighteen forty eight. Uh, right. There was a, a Guatemalan newspaper that covered all of Central America during the colonial mm. period. Mm. And after independence, there were like two or three different newspapers that died after a few years. Mm. But it was not until the Republic was founded that the government finally consolidated and started to publish their own newspaper, mm. followed by some kind of semi-official newspapers. Right. But there's also a problem of, um, of, lack, of, of lack of readership. It's mm -hmm. not until the, the the educational reforms of the mm -hmm. 1860s and 1870s right. that suddenly a literacy in Costa Rica spikes. So it's, it's fascinating. You can see it precisely on the boom of the newspapers from two or three newspapers that existed in the 1850s and 60s. Suddenly in the 70s, you have like 10, 20 newspapers uh, going uh, on yeah, for a read. very small population. Mm. It's almost like Benedict Anderson is confirmed in everything you do for Costa Rica. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I, I didn't think about it because uh, I love that the theory of the imagined communities uh, yeah. of Benedict Anderson, but but the idea of uh, print capitalism, I think it has been criticized a lot because in some places it doesn't work. Yeah. But you may be right. I, I have to review, rethink about this. Maybe in Costa Rica it may have worked. Yeah, because that's, uh, or at least it concurrently develops with the, each mm -hmm. other, right? That sort of the nationalism and the print culture kind of feed off of each other in, in kind of formulating the identity for Costa Rica. Oh, well, there we go. Next project. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but be, when you said like the the smallness like the kind of the literacy problem then also the smallness of the country population wise um trying to think here did i publish the blog on this or not I, I can't remember if i actually did because i i kind of looked at latin america briefly a little bit here and there and one of the things that always struck me was sort of the like you look at the american civil war right and it's like 600,000 soldiers or like a million soldiers that are fighting 
um, hundred thousand in one army, sixty thousand in the other, and then you look at Latin Americans, like army of four thousand versus an army of five thousand, and it always felt like tiny, right? It's like tiny in comparison to these massive civil war armies in the north. But then when you when I think you mentioned like Costa Rica has a population of about two hundred thousand people, and it's just it makes sense that you don't have the body count to do a large army in that case. Actually, in the case of Costa Rica, at that time, it was smaller. It was 50,000 people in the whole country. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean... Still, we are still a, a small country. We're like yeah. a, about 5 million people, right? Yeah, yeah. But at that time, it was 50,000 people, most of them concentrated in the Central Valley in the main cities. Yeah. So actually far away from the borders. Yeah. And uh, if you think about it, uh, also the filibuster army was was small. Um, mm -hmm. Some uh, uh, historians have tried to actually make, uh, you know, calculate the numbers mm -hmm. according to all the migration records of all the filibusters and the different nodes that uh, Walker had and all that. Yeah. It seems that the, the, uh, the peak, uh, Walker had about 5,000 uh, soldiers in his army. And... Um, mm. That's huge, yeah, though, when you think of a country that has 50,000, right? That's 10% of the population. Well, actually, that's Walker in Nicaragua. Costa yeah. Rica actually had 9,000 soldiers. That's like 20% of the population under arms. 20% of the population and 40% of the male population. I, 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 When I see these numbers, I start to recheck and recheck. Because yeah. I was thinking, I don't think that even the Soviet Union had that many soldiers during World War II at one point, you know? No. Like, I mean, in percentage. Hugely, uh, yeah, that's a it, hugely militarized society. Just imagine that the, the, the logistics, the organization yeah. for, for this that's army. Now, of course, war. the army was, was spread around in different places. So there was never a battle of 9,000 versus 5,000. That never happened. Uh, battles were actually uh, some of the largest ones were like uh, about 1,000 versus 800 or something like that. Oh, tiny. Still a decent yeah. size. And that's without counting that the rest of the Central American armies. Well, Honduras mm -hmm. sent only like 200 soldiers. But El Salvador and Guatemala together, they sent about uh, 4,000 soldiers. Okay. So wow. for the population of, uh, at that time, it, it was a massive movement in reality. Wow. Yeah. That Wow. <laughs> Tells me how much I have to learn about Latin America here. This is, this is a crazy to kind of think about that. That the Costa Rican army also had something interesting because Costa Rica had been in in, in had some tensions with Nicaragua in the late 1840s. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there was a concern about a possible invasion. So mm. actually, President Mora, who was the same president when the filibusters invaded, uh, started to to um, enhance the size of the army and also the training. He started to bring some Prussian and Polish uh, uh, instructors, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. and he connected with the uh, with the United uh, Kingdom and was able to get um, possibly the first. Um, um, I, I forgot oh, the name the of the rifle, rifle right? right? Of the Soviet, the, the Enfield, Enfield, yes, yeah, which was a a, a Minier bullet uh, rifle. Yeah, that's so, that's hugely marked up in my text of your book. <laughs> I that think it's the second place in the world where this rifle is used. I think it was used in Crimea first, yeah, and then in Costa Rica against the filibusters. So it's really oh, impressive. Yeah, because the like English mutiny, no, the Indian mutiny comes a year after that. It exactly. So wow, yeah, no, totally. It tells you a bit about that the importance that Mora gave to the army and, and yeah, yeah. luckily because that's actually. The modern weaponry, the instructions, yeah. and all that was that what what allowed uh, Costa Rica to defeat the filibusters. Of course, then you have that central irony of the sort of the end of your book in a country that has no military today anymore. That's actually one uh, that the first article I, I wrote because I was fascinated by that, and and again this mm -hmm. insider outsider thing, right? I was thinking about these uh, celebrations. And then I look at the statue of Juan Santa Maria dressed in a military uniform. And of course, he's remembered uh, in, in Alajuela as a, as a regular uh, um, working class person. She, he used mm -hmm. to actually have regular jobs like painting houses, running right. errands from the barracks to other places and so on. And I was thinking, interesting that we are celebrating a military guy mm -hmm. instead of just a common Juan Santa Maria because he was a military guy for three months. Yeah, and then I was thinking, wait, we don't even have an army. 
We haven't had an army since 18, uh, 1948. Mm -hmm. Why are we celebrating a military hero in a right. country without an army, right? So that yeah. that was kind of a part of what started to spark my interest in this. Okay, when did this start and has it changed? And oh, it right. has. Since oh. 1948, I, I based this on analysis that an, an article of two Norwegian guys, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to destroy their last names, but I think it's pronounced uh, Hervik and Az. I may be totally wrong. But um, they actually made an analysis about Costa Rican uh, uh, transformation in the society mm -hmm. and uh, when they can say it was a demilitarized country. And of course, mm -hmm. as a Costa Rican, I'm thinking, yeah, 1948, the, the, the mm -hmm. army was abolished. We don't have soldiers anymore, and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. No, of course not. Because the tradition of using, mm -hmm. for example, military ranks stayed in the police until the 1990s. By okay. then, they started to drop these ranks and change the names, right? Okay. Uh, the kind of uniforms they used. They even had mm -hmm. helmets at some point, the kind of weaponry. Right. And uh, some other things. And uh, and that actually also was part of the of the celebrations of Philip Buster War. During the 1950s and 60s, you saw some mm -hmm. uh, military bands playing military music. Right. Was, there's no they, military. They, no military, but but yeah. the but militarization is still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not until the night late nineteen eighties and early nineteen nineties that starts to change, and then you start mm. to hear actually the the school bands, which were you know dressed like right. like a, yeah. a military kind of style, like in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And marching and marches are military. Yeah, yeah. Um, suddenly changing, and then playing suddenly a, a cumbia, a mambo, and I was like, right. oh, this is interesting. It's fun. And you mm -hmm. could see actually the people in, in, in on the streets that saw them march in very in a very solemn manner, starting to kind of dance, you know, to the new music yeah. and, and start to change. And the newspapers recorded that. Mm -hmm. One newspaper actually was so surprised because <clears throat> Costa Rica is a multicultural country, of course. And uh, in the Atlantic zone, um, um, the majority of the population are descendants uh, from people that came from the Caribbean islands mm -hmm. uh, to build the, the train, the railroads. Yeah. Uh, mostly from Jamaica, but also some more islands. And that culture is still very prevalent there, mm -hmm. including the kind of music they play. Okay, so, so now sort of like the, the cultural interchange of the music that's starting to come out again. And oh, Exactly. Wow. It's more tropical, more dancing, more... Yeah. And, and that starts to transform things. And, and mm -hmm. if you go to any parade right now, the... The baton, how do you call this? Uh, um, usually, the girls that go in front of them of, of the band, they have a baton. Uh, yeah, they have a I don't know. I, I forgot. <laughs> I've never been in band. Well, usually they they uh, did the same yeah. things that they do in the United States. They throw the baton up yeah. and then they do these kind of things. Right. Not anymore. Marching. Oh. Now they're not marching. Okay. If you see, they are dancing. Huh. Okay. You can see the steps and they are dancing salsa, cumbia, mambo, and. And uh, making wow. this very tropical, as as if they were in a dancing uh, salon, yeah. you know, it's it's fascinating. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, it it makes total sense, right? From what you said, it's towards the end of the book that this transformation that is taking place, um, kind of modernizing the events out of this military conflict into something that's meaningful for this generation. That that's a key word, with it, right? That's a key word, meaning. Yeah. Because of course, all these uh, celebrations have a meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're supposed to carry some values. Yeah. The problem is that all societies are dynamic. All societies change. Yeah. And yeah, therefore, exactly. all these events that we are celebrating, all these sites of memory, kind of a quote in Pierre Nora, they have to be transformed because the values of the society mm -hmm. transform. So you cannot stay with the same values. No. You have to kind of reread them if you want. You have to transform yeah. them. And this is one, one result. This popular culture getting into yeah. official culture. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even though sometimes you could ask, what is official culture sometimes in cases? But uh, before we get there, <laughs> there was okay. one thing that you did mention in, in your earlier answer that I wanted to get back to because you kind of kind of talked about the kind of different jobs that Juan Santa Maria had taken and um, sort of that he probably was for a working strata of some sort. And I, I kind of because we're talking Hispanic culture and sp sp Hispanic kind of society here in, in, in Costa Rica, it's a very stratified society I usually think of. And how how does that kind of play into, I guess, first of all, this filibuster war, sort of the defense of the country, but then 
also when we think of like again going back to anderson him saying that it's it's a very kind of elite top down imagining that takes place and how does that sort of impact that you have sort of this commoner and the elite on top that kind of pulls them up and says this is the guy we're going to celebrate now that's a very interesting story and that's actually what caught my my attention the most when i was writing this and i i keep discovering more things that are not in the book anymore but <laughs> well, they're not yet right maybe if i revise it version I'll two the version two yeah part two <laughs> So the story of Santa Maria as a national hero in Latin America is a little bit different, actually, not only from Latin America, but from the whole world. If you think mm -hmm. about it, most of the national heroes are presidents or generals. Mm -hmm. Not in Costa Rica. The national hero is a common soldier. Mm -hmm. And it's possibly the first country that had a common person as the national hero. Now, in this, one mm -hmm. of the reasons may be because how Costa Rica was... Uh, in the 1850s. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, there is a lot of talk about stratification and uh, social differences and the caste system mm -hmm. in Latin America during the colonial period and all that. A lot of historians have tried to analyze why Costa Rican national identity may be a little bit different from other countries. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they found out is that Costa Rica is actually, even with the high standards of living that they, they, they have now in human index and all these other kind of standards that they always talk about, it, it is gave be by the... a global politics students a nightmare. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's, it was one of the most isolated regions of the Spanish Empire and one of the poorest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And that's very important mm -hmm. because it was so poor that we basically did not, not have any kind of nobility during the colonial mm -hmm. period. The, okay. the amount of money that they were able to make was very little. Also, right. uh, they had very few slaves. Yeah. The indigenous population... I, we think because disease had been decimated as well, mm -hmm. so they could not use that many indigenous population as servants or as lower classes. Yeah. And then in, in most cases, they start to mix as well. So what happens is that we have a very small population mm -hmm. in which everybody's basically related. Right. So you're not going to actually enslave your third cousin, right? Because <laughs> your aunt during the, during the birthday is going to say, hey, what are you doing? You know, yeah. that's the the son of, of Aunt Rita or whatever, you know, so. Yeah. Well, you it's coming behave. after you. <laughs> so that's the point. It's, it's, it's uh, it complicates the situation in Costa Rica yeah. so much that, and actually there's a, there's a, a, a book, um, uh, Samuel Stone, actually, um, he was born in Costa Rica, but uh, his mother was a very famous uh, U.S. anthropologist, Tori Stone. And um, he wrote a book uh, called, um, the dynasty of the conquistadors and he made an analysis mm. of costa rican politics in relation to the three main conquistadors of costa rica and he discovered that all presidents in the history of costa rica including the current one with the exception of two presidents all of them are related all of them descend from the same three conquistadors and the families holy. have intermarried holy cow so that tells you a little bit about the story of the elites all the yeah. elites know that they are related, yeah, yeah. but they also know they also know that the lower classes are kind of related. Yeah. And so going back to the story of Juan Santa Maria, um, first of all, Alajuela was a small town in a country of 50,000 people. This may have been, what, 10,000 people, maybe? It's the second city of the country. Let's, let's use that number just for the sake of it. So everybody knew who he was. Right, yeah. Especially because, because he was running errands from the soldiers in the barracks to, mm -hmm. I don't know, to the church, to the local uh, yeah. uh, grocery store, to whatever. Everybody knows who he is. Right, right, yeah. So the interesting thing is that, and this is not in the book, but actually I have been talking to some local historians in, in Alajuela, and they realize that actually Juan Santa Maria is connected to the elites. True, he's from mm -hmm. the lower classes, but his mother used to work for the most influential family in Alajuela. So actually, mm -hmm. the elites know these people. All right. And the presidents, and this is part of the book I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, the, how the elites conform their governments. During the liberal, liberal period uh, of 1870 to the late uh, 1880s, all these presidents are ruling from Alajuela. They are connected to each other. 
-hmm. And they are the ones that impose Juan Santa Maria as the national hero. Because in some way, it's saying, if Alajuela has the national hero, it's because Alajuela is the most important place in Costa Rica, without being yeah, yeah. the capital city still. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a matter of politics. That's why they're choosing Juan Santa Maria. And he, he's still good because he is part of implicitly the family. And he's part of the family. So Gosh. he worked for us. We know That's him. crazy. That is so crazy. Well, I guess it eliminates the one question that I was going to also ask. Is he <laughs> real was. or not? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, although there, there have been ch some challenges against that, especially the, in the early 1900s. They found a, a, a book of the functions of the soldiers of the, of the filibuster war. Oh. And um, um, a priest, actually the, the, the chaplain of, of the army, had a rec record of all the, all the people that died. And oh. the name of Juan Santa Maria shows up as somebody that died of cholera morbus. Uh, uh, there was yeah. an epidemic of cholera during those times entering Costa Rica. So that is a, a big problem because, uh, I mean, the audience uh, yeah. don't know this part of the story. We haven't gone into that. But Juan Santa Maria becomes a national hero because actually he he burns uh, the fortifications where William Walker and his soldiers are hiding. Yeah. And that actually allows him to win the battle against William Walker. And the, but he dies by doing that. So the idea that in a book says that Juan Santa Maria actually did not die during that battle, but days after, kind of mm. makes the whole mid collapse. Right, right. Because all of a sudden it's like Nazi heroes' deaths, um, right. kind of defeating the enemy. It's all of a sudden like, oh, he's just. Like, he's just. What was he doing? Exactly. Yeah. Well, it happens that later we find some more information. There were at least five Juan Santa Marias because it was a common last name with a very common name. Yeah, so we of have course. them dying in yeah. different places. But we have records, for example, of his mother, the one I told you that was working for the elites, yeah. asking for a pension because this was the only son that was able to work and he was so he sustained the family economically. So now she doesn't have the son, so mm -hmm. she's asking for a pension. This is just a year and a half after he died. And he, and she kind of describes how he dies, mm -hmm. and then uh, mm -hmm. which is recognized that Congress right. actually gives her the money, and um, then we have some witnesses. Even one of the main generals of the army, uh, that actually is the brother of one of the presidents of Costa Rica in the future mm -hmm. in the eighteen seventies, he actually wrote his diary. He mentions the soldier because, and and curiously enough, he says because we used to bathe together. There was a river crossing the city. Mm. And when it was really hot, all the kids actually jump into the into the river, mm -hmm. poor kids and elite kids. And right. this guy remembers that, so he mentions. So we know that he existed, of course. Okay. But there, but there was some doubt at some point. Huh. It, it's always fascinating when you have those sort of like like the, those local legends, local figures that then become the the national heroes. And um, but I I. I now that you kind of told me a little bit of your background story, I I also find it even more self-reflective because you you mention in, in the book in a couple of places the first people that actually talk about Juan Santa Maria. And it's all outsiders. It's all foreigners who come to Costa Rica, who reside in the capital for a little bit of time. And hears these stories and singles this this one individual out as the one that they should focus on so it's i guess the question in there is did you feel kind of that, that connection to these historical <laughs> figures from like i think one of them was from panama or um did that sort of just was it sort of a slip to put that kind of comment into the book I, I haven't thought about it, and uh, I think that 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 the thing that connects us is that the freedom that being a little bit foreign gives us. Mm. And uh, this this may be for the audience because, of course, um, Juan Santa Maria was not recognized as a national hero for a long time. But not only that, the memory of the filibuster was hidden by mm. the enemies of the president Mora, that was actually in charge of the army during the filibuster war. Mm. Again, these elites, although they were relatives, they were also uh, interested in different political uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, directions, but also different um, approaches to politics, who was in charge and all that. So what happens with Mora is that actually his brother-in-law uh, 
actually delivers a coup d'etat, so basically mm -hmm. overthrows him. Mm -hmm. And then after an internal conflict, Mora is executed, which mm -hmm. is the, the big scene of politics in Costa Rica. This this uh, never happened later, and, and people are still actually discuss about why they execute him all that, especially because he was a relative. So yeah. when this new president comes to power, he obscures everything connected to the filibuster war. And the reason is very simple. Mm -hmm. If we are celebrating the filibuster war, we're celebrating Mora. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. Man. There's an, a national holiday celebrating the filibuster war. We have to eliminate it. And they did. Mm -hmm. Not only that, we have to eliminate any reference to Mora in the filibuster mm -hmm. war. Right. For about 10 years, that happens. Mm -hmm. But during the celebrations of independence in 1864, um, a Colombian, well, he was from Panama, but Panama was part of Colombia at that time. Jose de Ovaldia, he was a political refugee because, of course, there were a lot of political conflicts right. in Colombia. He escapes to Costa Rica. He's received. And then he's asked, because he's a very famous uh, orator, uh, to actually give a speech for independence. Mm -hmm. Now, when he arrived to Costa Rica, he arrived to Alajuela. Mm -hmm. That's where actually he spent several years. And he realized that there was a very important story to res rescue, which is the story of Juan Santa Maria. Of course, since he was living in the houses of the Elise of Alajuela, he has been, I'm sure, hammered with the story of Juan Santa Maria every mm -hmm. night at dinner, right? <laughs> Hopefully I'm not every that. night. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, when he gives, gives this speech celebrating the independence of Costa Rica, he remembers. Mm -hmm. But remember, Costa Rica didn't fight a war of independence. Mm -hmm. But we fought a war for sovereignty, which was the filibuster war. And then he mentions Juan Santa Maria and rescues the figure. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that in those 10 years, is the only mention of Juan Santa Maria. Yeah. And by the way, he does not make a mention a single mention of President Mora. I think that he knew that mm. I may be able to talk about Santa Maria, but if I mention Mora, uh, they are going to kick me out of the country. So it's a little bit of that safety. notion Personal of being a, a foreigner that allows me yeah. to be a little bit different and do some things without being yeah. judged as hard as if I'm a local, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. part of what's going on here. The second case is almost 10 years later, 1873. And this is already when that elite that was anti-Mora is already gone. Mm -hmm. So there's a new elite that actually are concentrate their power in Alajuela. So these, of course, are uh, are people that um, President Guardia, who was the first one of these dynasty of politicians, was actually a hero of the filibuster war. But mm. he actually was not a member of the elites. Okay. So he's the first one that is not a member of the elites that is actually going to be in power. So how do you le legitimize your power? Well, with the use of force, he's a military mm -hmm. guy. Right. But what if I recover the memory of the filibuster war, make it that center of national identity, and of mm -hmm. course, I fought in the filibuster war, so I'm a hero of the filibuster war, so it makes a lot of sense that I recovered that. Mm -hmm. So another Colombian refugee actually writes the first play in which the name of Juan Santa Maria is used. The name of Mora actually comes back and some other heroes of the filibuster war, but Juan Santa Maria is the first time that he is mentioned. And again, not a president, not a general, just a common soldier, mm. and he's being rescued. This tells us actually that there's a memory, a, a, a popular memory of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, Santa Maria in Alajuela, yeah. that people are remembering this guy all the time, and that therefore... It makes sense that if you live in Alajuela, because this guy, Lleras, Jose Maria Lleras, also lived in Alajuela, is going to talk about Santa Maria. Yeah, that's sort of the moment where you wish you had sort of a time machine or somebody discovers like this beautiful diary, right? That like, like what was what was April 11 like in Alajuela, Alajuela in like 1862 or in 1870? Right. Before kind of that hype, before he's sort of nationally recognized, right? Sort of like that would be so brilliant to kind of kind of get your get your hands on that that na that local narrative, that local story, um to kind of get to that. That would be amazing. Actually, that's part of the project as well, because I started to look on on when April eleventh started to be celebrated. Yeah. And I started to try to go back. And before it became the national holiday, it was already celebrated in Alajuela yeah. for a few years. 
but not in the 60s or 70s. It was a little bit later. Okay. But that's when I discovered that actually Costa Rica celebrated a different holiday to remember the, the filibuster war. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. We have two different holidays? Why did we change? Who wasn't behind this? And who actually created the first one? And who was in favor of eliminating this, this one and in favor of producing the new one? That I have yeah. never seen anywhere else. I mean, yeah, the that... company always has the same holiday for years and years and years. Right, right. And uh, that was fascinating, too, of like how... And I was just going to go there, actually. You you opens the door and I'm going to step through it. <laughs> May 1st, the holiday for the filibuster war. Or as the rest of the world calls it, May Day or Labor Day. Labor Day. It's Labor Day in Costa Rica, too. Yeah, but it was also and that's actually the problem. Day. That's how it started. Yeah. What happens is that we have several uh, days that are important for the filibuster war. Uh, March 20, which has never become a real holiday, but people remember it here and there. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk 11, about that later. Right. April 11 is actually the day of Juan Santa Maria. So it's the national mm -hmm. holiday right now. But before that, it was May 1st. And the reason for that is that when the Central American armies corralled uh, uh, Walker in Rivas, they put a siege on him and his army. It's on May 1st, 1857, that he finally surrenders. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the war. So if you think about it, it's... Um, it's like the end of, of World War II, right? That's yeah. that's the day you celebrate. Victory Day. You still celebrate in, in, in Russia, right? Yeah. So it's the same day. So um, May 1st, therefore, is declared by the President Mora as the national holiday. It's celebrated for two or three years until he's deposed. Mm. And then silence comes. There's no celebration. Right. So when Guardia comes to power and he wants to connect himself with the filibuster war, and try to recover the memory, mm. he's the one that actually recreates May 1st in 1873. That's the first mm. time it starts to be officially celebrated. Now, celebrated with a dinner, and he invites right. some ambassadors. So it's a very official, right? Very elite. Yeah. yeah. But he realizes that he's gaining some support. Mm. So the next years, he starts to ask for the flag of Costa Rica to be posted on all the government buildings and all mm -hmm. the, the whole country. To remember people, this is May 1st. So in some way, this is the typical, as, as Antonio Gramsci uh, mentioned, you know, the dominant versus the subaltern mm -hmm. cultures, right? The dominant kind of creating a narrative that's going to go down uh, uh, into that common people. Mm -hmm. And it happens. Little, little by little, people start to celebrate it. Um, there are dances in some places celebrating these and so on for uh, several years. Until the 1880s, 1890s, that it becomes really that, that national holiday. Uh, it's fascinating to read the newspapers and how some um, editorials actually mm -hmm. say, we, su we should not celebrate uh, Independence Day anymore. We should actually move it to May 1st and celebrate that as our national holiday. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen, but right. it tells you a little bit about the public opinion, where, where it's heading, mm -hmm. right? It, I think because the meaning is, is more relevant. Yeah, and it's fascinating when you think about it, right? Like so many yeah. Latin American countries, like you say in the book, or even North America, Independence mm -hmm. Day is a big holiday, but not not for Costa Rica. No, and the reason <laughs> is because, again, Costa Rica didn't fight a war of independence. Second, Independence Day is, a, how can I say it? An externally imposed holiday. Mm, because of the Confederation. Exactly. September 15 is imposed by the Central American Federation because that's yeah. the day in which the Act of Independence is signed in Guatemala City. Yeah. But I, we have to remember the colonial system, uh, the Spanish colonial system, mm -hmm. was very federative, if you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Central America, each town had a, a lot of autonomy. Mm -hmm. So when the Act of Independence of Guatemala arrives to Costa Rica, that doesn't mean, oh, yes, we are independent. No. Costa Rica has to call representatives from each town to gather and decide if they want to accept independence or not. So they do it in December. Yeah. And still Costa Ricans don't celebrate December because when Costa Rica finally decides to join the Federation, uh, September 15 is voted in by the Congress and that Ooh. stays, it sticks. Right. But I claim it's not a real Costa Rican uh, national holiday. Yeah. And, and there's this is controversial in Costa Rica if I say that, there are going to be a lot of people standing and saying, what are you talking about and all that? But 
if you see it from that point of view, especially because at that time Costa Rica was thinking on joining Colombia. Mm. They finally joined, oh, wow. uh, he, he was thinking on joining Mexico. Mm. Then he finally joined Central America. And it became an independent republic until 1848. So mm -hmm. there it, it goes. Late, yeah. with September 15. Yeah. Well, well then, of course, you get some male, male problems, right? With sort of like, right. here, here's your elite that controls the wealth in the country. And here's your workers who are wanting to, in a Marxist sense, overthrow the elite. And of course. Uh, like Paris Commune and anarchism, <laughs> they won't help in the and all Indeed. the protests and strikes in the United States don't help with sort of that as sort of a peaceful holiday on May 1st. And that's exactly what happens with May 1st. The late 1890s, uh, after the Haymarket um, um, affair in Chicago, mm -hmm. the, um, the International Socialist declares uh, May 1st as their mm -hmm. holiday. They try to <clears throat> promote that. And in Costa Rica, of course, by the late 1800s, there are already some um, labor movements, um, mm -hmm. artisan uh, unions, uh, mm -hmm. and some more kind of unions are already in existence. And by the um, early 1900s, they start to gather, gather more and more strength. They start to march, actually, in the capital. Mm -hmm. um, that's still traditional. Every May 1st, uh, the workers in Costa Rica still march. It's a national holiday, Labor Day. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that the elites actually start to realize something. In 1913, which is the largest demonstration, the workers' demonstration in Costa Rica, um, of all these unions mm -hmm. uh, claiming, you know, labor rights and all that, it happens that the situation in Costa Rica and Central America and the Caribbean is very delicate. Mm -hmm. The United States is expanding as an empire very fast. Yeah. By 1912, that same year, they actually invaded uh, Cuba mm -hmm. and occupied the island. They invaded Nicaragua and occupied for uh, 15 years. Yeah. So Costa Rica actually started to see the United States as a threat. Remember, this is also a, a period of development of some kind of Latin American uh, nationalism with uh, the writing of Ariel Rodó and some uh, Jose Marti and some other works that are claiming for this clash between the Anglo-Saxon America and the Latin America, right? Oh, yeah. So, well, if you remember, actually... Uh, that's exactly what's happening during the filibuster war. It's yeah. a clash between Anglo-Saxons and Latin Americans and their views of the world. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is not, I'm just not making this up, Inclu actually the term Latin America became popular in 1856 and 1857. Filibuster wars. There are, yeah. there are two poets, especially a Colombian and a Chilean, that start to publish poems talking about Walker in the heroic defense of Central America against Anglo-Saxon expansion. Mm -hmm. And they are the first ones to use the term Latin America. So you can mm -hmm. see this, this is permeating the situation. So basically, workers celebrating Labor Day on May 1st that coincides with a filibuster war realize, oh, actually, we are rejecting the, the imperialism mm -hmm. of the United States, which is what the filibuster war is about as well. And the elites are like, oh, we have to figure this out. <laughs> Yeah. So it's fascinating because yeah, yeah. the next year, the next year, there's a union created by the government that actually is going to celebrate on May 1st, not Labor Day, but Arbor Day. So you can see a, a very clear mani manipulation here to mm -hmm. start to divest the meaning of the filibuster mm -hmm. war in connection with the May 1st. Yeah. And by 1915, the Congress actually passes a... Uh, um, a decree that commemorates April 11 as the new holiday celebrating the filibuster war. Now, the two holidays are going to exist at the same time, but a matter of 10, 15 years later, because the government is not supporting the Whoa. celebration May, May 1st, basically it dies. And April 11 is, is, is the one that stays. I haven't seen this in any other country, this kind of a yeah. political uses of memory so blatant, you know, and so open. Yeah. Well, and also the sort of like manipulation of like, oh, somebody takes over this holiday, we're going to just move it to another day. <laughs> like, 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 I guess you could make the claim in the US that they don't celebrate Labor Day on May 1st and have it in, in September, but it it's not the same really in, in that. Um, so it, it, yeah, total, it, it just, that was just fascinating in so many regards of like this, this relationship, but it sort of also brought to mind, like you, you already mentioned, sort of the uh, 
um, the emergence of U.S. Im or I guess the reemergence really because of filibuster war is an imperial mm. outlook of the United States. The reemergence of the United States is sort of an imperial hegemon in the Caribbean basin. But it's not just the United States, right? It's like companies like United Fruit who also have that kind of like filibuster or imperial <laughs> undertone to them. So like how much do the workers look also to these companies as sort of like filibusters that are coming to the to Costa Rica and like taking over land, taking over resources and kind of like in their mind at least connecting themselves to these freedom fighters for lack of a better term. Indeed, actually, the term filibuster in, in Costa Rica became a, 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 has a very clear meaning. If they accuse you of being a filibuster, it means you are a, either a traitor or a sold out, or somebody that, that that prefers the empire than Costa Rica. Right? It's a matter of sovereignty and national identity. Oh wow! Now the Unifor Company is a very interesting case, and again, it talks about how Costa Rica did things a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Now the Unifor Company, of course. Uh, played very hard, especially in Guatemala and Honduras, right? With mm -hmm. millions of, uh, sorry, thousands of people uh, dead because uh, um, their political maneuvering, right? And all the political instability, dictatorships and all that. Mm -hmm. In Costa Rica, of course, they started to manipulate the situation as well. At least they tried. Mm -hmm. And then in fact, uh, the United Fruit Company is going to become the center of the most important labor movement. Mm -hmm. And, but different from Colombia, for example, where um, actually Gabriel Garcia Marquez talks about this in, in, in 100 Years of Solitude, of the, the, the massacring of, of workers in the United Fruit Company. Mm -hmm. um, and Costa Rica actually became the most important moment for workers because it's a massive strike and the United Fruit Company has to figure out what to do because mm -hmm. the government is not siding with the United Fruit Company as, mm -hmm. as the governments in other countries did. Right. So the, here basically the United Fruit Company has to deal directly with the workers. And it's so successful, that strike, that actually in 1930, it allows for the creation of the Communist Party. Now, we call it the Communist Party. They didn't call themselves like that. It was the Workers and Farmers Party or something like that. Mm, but, uh, right. but later, it was very clear that all the leaders were uh, had a very strong uh, Marxist uh, approach. Still yeah. not Stalinist. And that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, kind of a very local version of communism. But anyway, mm. that's another story. <laughs> The important thing is that these communist parties continue to use the idea of the filibuster war from there on to challenge the power of the corporations. The UFO mm -hmm. company, of course, but mm -hmm. some others. There's one problem, though. Most of what they did was on uh, ephemera, which are these flyers that usually archives don't collect. So we don't have most of that or those printings and information. Oh. There are a few here and there. But... This is my personal memory. I remember seeing these uh, uh, posters on the on the light posts, oh, yeah, um, yeah. protesting oh. against different uh, um, uh, corporations. Alcoa, for example, the aluminum company of, mm -hmm. of America. Mm -hmm. There was a massive protest against them in the 1970s, and the Communist Party actually took a, uh, advantage of that and had a lot of posters right. with a torch symbolizing Juan Santa Maria attacking mm -hmm. Alcoa. So you can see that. Yeah. Also, the newspaper of the Communist Party is going to be very helpful, especially because there is a cartoonist, Hugo Diaz, that was published constantly in that um, in that newspaper. I think I, I published a, a couple of those uh, cartoons in, in the book. And uh, and he constantly uses that image of Juan Santa Maria as, yeah. as kind of an anti-corruption uh, symbol. Mm -hmm. So every time that the government actually favors uh, an international corporation, Juan Santa Maria is there to protest. But it's also the one uh, pushing people to rebel against against the corruption of the government in general mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So yes, wow. wow. Like, again, you you use the characters that you have available for your own own benefits. Um, <laughs> wow, crazy. Um, oops, wrong place. Now let's just go to the third one because we have may 1st we have april 11th now we need to go to march and this is the commemoration of the battle of santa rosa that's right and which is kind of like again this is from all the things that you're saying it's so fascinating right it's a country that has gone through a political civil war 
1948, um, decides to end the military, kind of sheds the symbolism, and then like, like just the way you tell the story of like how this, how these old former military men come out and this like massive almost military veteran event takes place at where this battle had taken place monuments being erected and it's just it's so counterclimactic right the military is gone but we're celebrating looking like the military actually the whole conflict is is i want to say confusing but very costa rican in its awkwardness <laughs> what happens is that actually in the 1940s we have a new government mm -hmm. um one of the members of the traditional uh, um, classic liberal elites, but educated uh, in Belgium and uh, with a strong influence on the socialist ideas of the church, right? The mm -hmm. social doctrine of the church. When he comes to Costa Rica, he becomes a reformist, very much mm -hmm. in the style of Roosevelt and some other uh, typical of the 1930s and in and, mm -hmm. and Europe and, and the Americas. Mm -hmm. It happens that, of course, there's a lot of resistance from the uh, more traditional elites. And uh, he realizes that in order to win the second elections, he has to appeal to the most, uh, um, how can I say, leftist groups. Mm. And he allies, he allies with the communists. Not only that, the church, which actually the, the head of the church is also in favor of all the ideas of the social doctrine of the church, allies. Mm. This is a very weird thing. The Communist Party allied with the church, allied with the liberals. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, but it's happening. No. Huh? <laughs> it's happening. Enemy of my enemy, groups, I suppose. <laughs> they are normal enemies, right? Because of the, all the liberal uh, anti-church uh, mm -hmm. uh, agenda, right? And, the, well, of course, the Communist Party and, yeah. and etc. But it happens that three of the, them are interested in the same things, mm. which is the creation of a labor code the mm -hmm. establishment of the eight hour minimum of a minimum wage of a, all these kind of a socialist uh, reforms typical of the 1930s mm -hmm. and for pension system, mm -hmm. health system, all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Well, the traditional elites uh, start to create a very tense uh, uh, environment in Costa Rica that finally ends uh, with the beginning of the civil war. Mm -hmm. It's a short lived civil war. It's damaging. I think there's still some trauma connected to that. Mm -hmm. But it divided the country or polarized it into groups. So basically those Calderonistas, which were the ones connected to the communist and church alliance, mm -hmm. and the Figueristas. Figueres became the leader of that more traditional group. So those are going to clash. So the United States is actually going to support the Figueristas, and they're going to win the war. The interesting mm -hmm. thing is that this guy Figueres, although he was an anti-communist, he was a social democrat. Oh. So once he arrives to power, he's going to keep all the reforms, yeah. which the traditional elites were fighting against. He's going to keep all the reforms yeah. and even go deeper. Right. This doesn't make any sense, but it happened. Yeah. And he's going to abolish the army. Mm -hmm. But the polarization exists. So all those uh, Calderonistas, including Calderon Guarde, Guarde who, was, who was the president, uh, leave Costa Rica. They are exiled. So like I said, it's a very strong uh, division, traumatic division in Costa Rica. Yeah. This guy that actually was allied with the communists goes to Nicaragua, and he receives the support of the dictator Somoza, Anastasio Somoza. Mm -hmm. Extreme right-winger supported by the United States. Again, yeah. what kind of alliances are happening here? Well, it ha happens that Figueres uh, um, is allied with Arevalo, the president of Guatemala, and they're starting a whole campaign of democratization of Central America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So they actually arm different groups to overthrow Somoza, to overthrow Trujillo and Dominican Republic, and mm -hmm. some other dictators. Yeah. So, of course, Somoza is an enemy of Figueres because Figueres wants to overthrow him. Right. So, again, the mafia thing, right? Uh, <laughs> my, the enemy of my enemy is my best friend. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's what's going to happen. Somoza allies... Supports militarily uh, Guardia, the Calderon Guardia, and Calderon Guardia actually invades Costa Rica. Mm. This is in 1955. The battle actually that defines the whole thing happens outside of the Hacienda Santa Rosa. Well, this Hacienda Santa Rosa was the same place 
in which Costa Rica defeated the, the vanguard of the filibusters exactly a hundred years later. I mean, before. Yeah. So this... <laughs> And March I think you 20... said that they actually on purpose fought the battle on that day because they wanted that connection. They wanted a connection, but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, the first battle happened in March 20, 1856, and the filibusters are defeated. This is the first defeat of the filibusters during the whole war. So it's very important symbolically. Yeah. And it is in Santa Rosa in 1955 that this new invasion is defeated. Now, it's an invasion from the north coming mm -hmm. from Nicaragua, to actually destroy the local government. So the association with the idea of the filibusters can be established. Mm. It's not the same, of course, but yeah. can be established. So the next year, on March 20, 1956, the 100th anniversary of the first battle of Santa Rosa, Figueres actually thinking that he's a genius. He says, <laughs> I'm going to celebrate 100 years later in Santa Rosa with all the veterans of this mm. battle. The problem is that inside Costa Rica, the opinions are still divided. Half mm. of Costa Rica supports Figueres, half of them support Calderon. And the problem is that they start to see this as, as a moment that we need to actually end this war, this conflict, mm -hmm. and start to create a sense of national unity. Mm -hmm. And Figueres, by celebrating this battle and recovering the memory of Santa Rosa, he, he even uh, proposes to create... Um, and he does create a national park mm -hmm. to create a monument there in Santa Rosa, and he wants to create a national holiday. Mm -hmm. But the press goes after him very hard and starts to say, if you do this, you're saying that you are the only winner and that you're going to decide what to do with Costa Rica, and this is not the moment for that. We need reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So what normally in any, other, in any other country will have signified a new holiday in Costa Rica collapses because it is it goes against the sense of national unity mm. that makes total sense wow but yeah it's, it's it's just fascinating when you think of like that use of history for your current political purposes again right again going back to your um your original argument um I'm kind of divided right now where, where I'm going to take this n towards the end, because in part, I'm kind of like the veterans op offer a lot of opportunities with regard to sort of like the, the, the thinking about like once veteran generations get older and die, it's sort of that mm. it encourages commemoration more so because, well, like we have to keep the memory of them alive. But I also was very interested by Stephen Palmer and that, that I, I, in my message to you, I call him a lightning rod and like, I'm open. Which one do you want to, which one do you prefer? Which one would you like to talk more about? I can about? connect them actually. Oh, okay. Can, Even better. I can connect them. <laughs> uh, Stephen Palmer in some way uh, inspired me to do this work. Um, oh, wow. I, I don't know him personally. So not him as a person, but yeah. reading his work. Yeah. Because, uh, um, Actually, his his article on Juan Santa Maria was very revolutionary, at least in Costa Rica. Um, yeah, I can he see actually, that. <laughs> what is, yes, he uh, um, he actually was the first one to bring the idea of Juan Santa Maria, and I, I can't even remember the title of his article, like the unknown soldier has a name in Costa Rica or something like that, which is mm. fascinating because he starts by talking about the unknown soldier in France and some other things. Uh, also in the United States, but he says that actually this is an unknown soldier, but he has a name. We mm -hmm. know who he is, yeah. and uh, he's a common soldier. But he in he represents the common people, but he's not a made up unknown soldier. We know who he is. Right. So what happens is this: in 1855, uh, the president of um, of Guatemala, Justo Rufino Barrios, decrees the unification or reunification of all of Central America. Mm -hmm. Well, Honduras agrees. Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and El Salvador say, and no, let's stop. <laughs> so the president of Guatemala decides to send an army that actually crosses El Salvador and is moving south. Costa Rica, Nicaragua declare war against Guatemala. The armies are moving north, but then the president of Guatemala is killed in one of the battles in El Salvador in Chalchuapa, and that basically ends the war. Mm. Now, 
what is happening, and this is what Stephen Palmer talks about in his, his article, is that Costa Rica, in order to bring or, or unify the whole country to engage in this war against uh, Guatemala, uses uh, the figure of Juan Santa Maria. And mm. uh, a, an article is published uh, in the newspapers, in the national, in the, in the government newspaper, talking about Juan Santa Maria and the memory of Juan Santa Maria. So again, talking about the common soldier defending the nation. So this is yeah. a very easy connection, right? It's a common soldier yeah. defending the country. So you should do the same. This is your example. Go. Yeah. Yeah. And his argument is that that is actually the moment in which Juan Santa Maria became the national hero and the moment in which the filibuster war was rescued and became the main or the core of national identity. Mm. And uh, my research actually find out that that is not exactly true. That actually was more than 10 years before, in 1873, that President uh, Guardia started to establish the basis for the recovering of the, of the filibuster war as memory, and that the memory of uh, Santa Maria with the uh, play in mm -hmm. 1873 and with all celebrations has already come up. Mm -hmm. What happened in 1885 is not only this war, but what happens is that there's a new generation of people coming to power. Mm. Like I mentioned, yeah. Guardia in 71 uh, becomes president. Uh, he stayed president for a long time. He was a veteran of the war. Mm -hmm. His successor, who actually was his, let me see, brother-in-law. I, I told you these connections of the elites. <laughs> uh, <laughs> becomes an ex-president. He mm. also was a veteran of the war, an officer. Mm. The third one, which is let me remember what is the connection. The third one, Bernardo Soto, is going to be married to, I may be wrong here, I think the granddaughter of President Guardia. I'm trying to remember, but what are the connections? No, the daughter of the second president, of Prof. Fernandez. Oh so they are all connected, these elites. Did you like draw like a diagram to kind of keep I, I did at yeah, some point, yes. Because there's another president that is actually connected to the, the cousin of... I mean, this, this is fascinating, all these people, you know. Well, this guy Soto, he's very young. Mm -hmm. He's only 30 years old. He actually was born during the filibuster war. Therefore, he cannot claim that he's a yeah. hero. Yeah. But he's also a general, a member of the military, like his two predecessors. Mm -hmm. He is connected to those same families. He is connected to that dynasty because clearly they have been working together. Soto have been a minister in the government of the other two. So how can he claim legitimacy? Mm -hmm. Well, by creating or consolidating, not creating because it was created already, the consolidating the figure of Juan Santa Maria. So it is in 1885 that he decrees the mm -hmm. erection or the construction of the statue to Juan Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. He's the one that actually makes Juan Santa Maria a national hero. And again, the building of the statue is going to be connected to the elites of Alajuela, and he is quintessential elite of Alajuela. So, I don't know, I think I have been able to connect these two things. And, and... Yeah, no, actually, it makes it even more fascinating because you're kind of now thinking of, like, Palmer, because you're kind of like, why... Palmer didn't dig deep enough, right? That he didn't see these earlier moments where... Juan Santa Maria was already used and did only see like, oh, there's a statue, that's when it starts. And it's like, no, it was before that, that it happened already. So it's... Yeah, I wonder. Uh, his initial work actually has is a comparison of, of liberalism in the late 1800s and uh, mm. between Guatemala and Costa Rica. So this is the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s right. uh, elites. And uh, I think that that's when he found the figure of Juan Santa Maria. I imagine... Like I said, I never talked to him or anything. Yeah. That he saw the statue, he knows that he's the national hero of Costa Rica, yeah. and tries to establish when he was created as a hero, and yeah. he finds this moment, which makes a lot of sense. Why he didn't yeah. go deeper? Well, sometimes we researchers, you know, assume yeah, we that, that, that we find it and this is it, right? And yeah. So I guess that's that's the reason. No, curious. Oh, but uh, well, that's always <laughs> the benefit when you have the language capabilities, local connections that you can actually go and kind of explore that in more detail, right? And kind of like, just like you found that pension request from um, the mother. It's, it's like all these things coming together that just add up to 
to create a more full picture. And that's, I guess, for students listening, there are still stories out there that you can research. <laughs> There is, there is actually. I remember when when we were talking about civil parliament years, uh, Palmer years ago, that actually uh, I heard a colleague saying at some point, "Well, I think that everything has been reading about the filibuster war now." That was before I published my book, and I was like, <laughs> "Oh, really?" And right now, actually, I'm starting more research in, into another process that has to do with logistics and the filibuster war. And I realized really? nobody has written anything about it, so no. I'm like, "Okay, no, there's still a lot more to to work on." Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have you back then in a few years' time. <laughs> wow. No, that's incredible. Um, but I think we are at almost an hour and a half, and I said we're oh, wow. going we're gonna to try and cap it at, at 12 for you, so we're almost at that, and we're probably going to chat for a minute afterwards. So at this stage, then, I'm going to say incredible book. <laughs> incredible story um there's a lot like uh, i love memory studies these days it's so fascinating to see kind of how history and memory and communities play into each other and that so it's it was a great book marco it was a great book um so thank you for letting me read it thank you for taking the time to um chat and share this with the um the audience thank you thank you so much Niels, and uh of course, I really appreciate your your words for for the book, and um, it was hard work, but also really fun because um, it, this is a kind of a research that you start to find more and more stuff, and you're like, really, really fascinating stories. And I didn't expect that. I thought it was going to be just a regular, very straightforward story of any kind of a holiday, right? And I really appreciate, you know, I I, I, uh, I have been seeing your work, of course, and and I. I realize that uh, that you understand a lot about memory studies and nationalism, and to surprise or interest somebody like you is really, really cool. <laughs> well, I, I, I I'm always open for new stuff, and this was definitely really nice new stuff to you know read about. Um, we need more of this type. We need a lot more good memory studies of this nature. Indeed, indeed. <laughs>